from a parent perspective, what I would say from our perspective is like, if we're going to have the conversation about Gen Z, let's have it with the goal of understanding each other, not trying to prove each other right or wrong. Yeah. So I think what happens in why the media displays a certain image about Gen Z is because people tend to get defensive when you come after them or their generation. And I think our goal is to have a conversation that we're go- not going in with the goal of proving you guys wrong or proving mm-hmm. you guys right, but it's like, hey, if we can better understand each other, I think actually us coming, t- I mean, there's so much similarities that people don't talk about between the generations. Sure. Like we've all had issues. We all have our strong suits. No one likes to talk about that. They just like to be like, Gen Z's lazy, they're entitled, but it's like, hey, if you just throw negative stuff at someone and with no solutions and you're not willing to have a conversation, what's the goal of that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Welcome to Cultural Catalyst, where we help you to learn how to live fully alive, co-labor with God, and change the world. I'm your host, Chris Valentin, and today I have some really interesting guests. I have to say that I've probably been some of the most excited about interviewing these two guys. And uh, This is Knight right here, Naronia. Naronia. That, that was it. That was pretty, pretty close. <laughs> and Joshua, I'm not even going to try that name. Go Altamora. Ahead. Altamora. And these guys have a podcast themselves. They have millions of views on their own podcasts, and they do. It's called Juvie, as in juvenile. In other yeah. words, they're they're dedicated to actually breaking the stereotype around Gen Z, which mm-hmm. is really exciting. And they interview entrepreneurs. I'm reading this: entrepreneurs, entertainers, influencers, and they ask them questions. And they really, they, I mean, it's just it's just been really really exciting. And actually, um, their dads work for me, and so I kind of heard about it through there. And, and then I, I heard how many people are actually listening to what you're doing. I'm like, man, we got to, I'd love to have them on. So before we get started talking about Juvie, yeah. I'd like to talk about you guys. Okay. Awesome. Okay, Knight, how old are you? 16. You're 16. Tell yes. us a little bit about you. I'm 16 years old. My name is Knight. Uh, Juvie is obviously my full-time passion, but I'm also a junior in high school, graduating a year early. So this year I'll be school out of the way full-time on Juvie. Uh, on top of that, I do marketing. So I own a marketing agency. We help people with like short form social media. So 30 to 60 seconds. And most of the people I'm helping are people trying to reach Gen Z. So that kind of oh, plays so into good. the podcast. And yeah, that's my 30 second bio. That's your 30 second bio? That is it. To you, Josh. My turn. Okay. I'm Josh. I'm 18. I um, graduated high school two years ago. So I've been out um, for a while. I am a chef. Um, I have a cookbook with a company called The Adventure Challenge. Um, oh, I know those guys. I had them on too. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I've got a cookbook with them. I now work at Theory in Reading, which is a coffee shop, um, and also working on Juvie as well. And your accent is? I'm from England. You're from England. So cool. Okay. So first of all, what is the vision for your podcast? I think the vision is to reverse the stereotype that's placed on Gen Z by the media or by other generations. I think there's been stereotypes that are placed that aren't necessarily true or it's just a standard that we've set that doesn't necessarily feel true for everyone that we're a part of. And so I think like going into it, that was like the initial goal. And I think it's just like built from there. Um, but yeah, we can get into like how it started and all that give, stuff. Give me a couple of ideas. First of all, Gen Z, you, d- you, you defined it just a few minutes ago from yeah. me off air. 10 year olds to 25 year olds. 10, 25 year olds. And what stereotypes do you guys think you're breaking? Like, what do you think when you, obviously you started this cause you're like, Hey, people see us a certain way yeah. and a bunch of that ain't true. Yeah. yeah. So what is it that ain't true from your guys' perspective? Well, yeah, I feel like, um, a big stereotype that gets put on teenagers is that um, we're lazy or we don't work hard, we don't have um, big goals or that we can't achieve those goals until we've either um, finished high school, gone through college and now have like a regular job that just pays the bills. I feel like that's pretty much the standard of what Gen Z and teenagers are set to achieve in their life. Um, But we've been trying to break the stereotype that you can actually achieve a whole lot more than that. And these years are the years where you have the most time on your hands and 
the time when we have probably the best opportunity to achieve your dreams. So do you think that Gen Zs tend to be uh, entitled? Yeah, I think what is something to like just make very clear in the beginning, it's not that they're necessarily not true, but I think there's room for them to be changed. Yeah. So I, I think they're, and when we're talking about teenagers not being lazy, like, let me just first put it out there. There's plenty of teenagers that are lazy. Mm. I think your teenage years, you're figuring out what you're supposed to do, and that tends to just, people just kind of turn into sheep in a way. You're figuring out, oh, he does that. Well, I want to do that. And so it's kind of like, but if, what if we can reset what is the normal? What is the stereotype? So Here's the standard. Let's go there. So when we're talking about teenagers being lazy or entitled, yeah, that's true. Like, I don't want to sit here and be like, nope, none of us are. Yeah. But I think between the generations, there's a misunderstanding of like, is it lazy or is it us understanding our options and our time? So I think it's more like, let's have, a, yeah. let's have a conversation about it before we just put these things in place. And so, yeah, I think there is some truth to it. There is teenagers that are entitled and there are teenagers that are lazy but what I'd like to say is I think some of it comes from that's what their friends are doing that's what's normal when you're yeah. 16 you're not supposed to be working for yourself you're supposed to be in high school partying so it's like if that's what we've set to be the normal and that's what everyone does well that's what people are going to follow yeah Got it. like when you're a teenager like you want to do what everyone else is doing because that's what's like comfortable you know so it sounds like you guys are kind of doing two things right like one you're defining what gen z, gen z is and where, where it's going. Mm -hmm. And two, you're inspiring the Gen Z yeah. generation, yeah. so to yeah. speak, the 10 to 25 year olds. And you're, you're kind of saying, hey guys, we're, so you're not just saying to the older generation, this is who we are. You're also saying to that, to that generation, to the Gen Z, Gen Z generation, yeah. hey guys, this is who, this is who we should be. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. How, uh, what kind of, I'm really interested in it, on your, on your, cause I haven't listened to your show. Yeah, I have yeah. to just be totally honest, but uh, I, I've heard lots about it. What kind of people do you have on there, and how are you shaping that those conversations to yeah. actually yeah. do what you just what you just talked about? Yeah, we've had a super wide variation of guests. Like we've gone from teenage Olympians to um, a teenager who makes rings out of spoons that he finds at thrift stores. Like it's a whole range of people who have um, achieved some really great things in their life and have tried to prove people that um, like they're doing this as teenagers. So why can't everybody else? Um, so when you said that we're trying to inspire people, I think that's very true. We're trying to show people that you can achieve more than what everybody's telling you to. So that's why we've had people from, um, yeah, a teenage Olympia uh, Olympian who, um, was one of the first people to ever skate in the Olympics wow. um, who skated for America. She was a great girl. Yeah. Um, and also people like um, a world champion surfer um, who wow. achieved that at just, was she 17 when she won the championship? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, people have achieved crazy stuff like that. What, what, what is the common thread? I know we're, we're, we're outside of the questions. We, yeah. But I'm interested, what do you think, what are you seeing as a common thread between, you know, those who are kind of entitled and lazy? Yeah. And those who have transcended that yeah. and have actually accomplished stuff and, and, and beginning to make their mark already. Yeah. What do you think, what do you see as the, is there, is there some common catalytic things yeah. in the lives of those that are, you know, in our mind, maybe yeah. more successful in, early, in their early I mean, years? Like it's it's obvious like your environment that you grew up in does contribute so much to it. And so we've yeah. been able to grow up in an environment where like failing wasn't a bad thing. You were supposed to take risks. You yeah. weren't supposed to do what everyone was doing. So like that was a massive contributor. Um, and I think when it comes to the guests, like we've gone from teenagers to we just had the former head of M Nike marketing at Nike, the oh, former wow. head. She came on our show. We had people that work in corporate America. Mm -hmm. So I think when talking with them, I think they 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 realize at a young age that at some point self-responsibility kicks in. Like at some point your parents aren't gonna do it for you. At some point you're gonna have to go in and get it yourself. So I think from the surfers to these massive, massive thought leaders in the marketing world, they all realize at a young age, it's like, if I'm gonna do this, I kinda gotta do it for myself. Yeah. So it. I think it's self-responsibility and that's something that our generation struggles with. Is yeah. we, it's so easy to blame people because we're, we're kind of living in a time where it's like, it's the easiest to not communicate for yourself because yeah. everyone puts their ideas out there. So it's so easy to just be a follower instead of, you know, no, this is what I believe, this is what I stand by. And so I think all these, these young people, they just realize that or that was instilled with them from parents. And your podcast, how is the Lord involved in this? Because I know you both, you're both believers. I th yeah. think you are. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this, I, 
I'm understanding that this isn't necessarily a Christian podcast, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. But it, does the Lord play any role in the podcast? I know yeah. he does in your life. I'm just wondering in specifically in the podcast. Yeah, 100%. Short, short story of how it came about. It was in a dream that I had. Kind of had prophetic dreams growing up my whole life. Funny, my name's Knight. Kind of, you know, goes together a little bit. But I was... <laughs> like I was, N-I-G-H-T Knight. Right, yeah. exactly. Not like when you the dream. Knight Shining Armor Knight. Right, yeah. right. But I was, I was in high school and I was looking around my surroundings. I was like, I think all these kids here are called to a higher standard, but they don't know what that is because there's no one that is their age that's doing it. Beautiful. Or they're already accomplished. And so what's cool is like, we've shown the process. We went from kids in high school to now people with the podcast. Um, but yeah, so I had the dream and it was... Basically, long story short, we had a podcast. We were the number one teenage podcast. And I woke up the next day. I told my dad, I was like, hey, I don't know if this is a thing. It sounds like really ridiculous. And he's like, just look into it. Sure enough, I looked on it. Across all platforms, there was no shows that were hosted by teenagers about teenagers. Wow. Everything was parents telling teenagers what teenagers are supposed to do. And, like, there's room for that to be influenced yeah. by an older generation. But for some teenagers, it's easier to listen to their peers. And so really? I think that's where the Lord came in. I mean, gave us the initial idea. Yeah, got it. And yeah, we're not, we're not, our, our followers know we're Christian. They know where yeah, we have our faith. Yeah, you're not anti-Christian on your podcast. Of course. Yeah, exactly. And I yeah. think, I mean, just like the testimonials we've had of people just like, they don't know why they love our show or they don't know why they feel so at home. And it's like, well, we know why, right? That's yeah. rocking. Yeah. What the older generation, what would you like to say to them? Like, you know, you know, you know you're, you're, you're trying, you know, you have a vision to actually solve a problem. And maybe I would say, in my own words, you're, you're, you're bridging the generations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're telling the younger generation, hey, you got to have a vision. You got to take some ownership of your life. You got to take responsibility for your life. And, uh, and those things are catalytic to like breaking out of that, yeah. maybe that lazy phase of life that we kind of all went through. Yeah. What are you, what, what do you want to say to the, to the older generation that is, you know, you know, especially I, I, I would be the way older generation, right? I, I'm baby boomer generation. Yeah. In my 60s, so we're like, oh, those guys are lazy. They don't really care about life. They've had everything handed to them. Yeah. What would you say to that that kind of generation? I think one thing that I'd say is let your kids have the opportunity to fail. Got um, it. I feel like a big thing that stops teenagers or young people or just anybody really. Um, from going after what they want to do is being brought down in their life from failing at something. Like you fail at a sport, you start doing really bad. Somebody tells you, oh, you should be doing a lot better. That makes you want to pull back. Like that makes you want to stop because you're just not going to be better than like how you are. Um, and I think that's just been a big thing for us as well is learning that failure is the best way to learn. Um, so I think if for parents to start letting their kids feel comfortable with trying something that might not be for them, but it might be, and letting them know that failure isn't the be all end all, you know? Um, that's really good. Yeah, I think that's what I'd say. I would add on to that, and I think it's from a parent perspective, and what I would say from our perspective is like, if we're going to have the conversation about Gen Z, let's have it with the goal of understanding each other, not trying to prove each other right or wrong. Yeah. So I think what happens in why the media displays a certain image about Gen Z is because people tend to get defensive when you come after them or their generation. And I think our goal is to have a conversation that we're go not going in with the goal of proving you guys wrong or proving mm -hmm. you guys right. But it's like, hey, if we can better understand each other, I think actually us coming to, I mean, there's so much similarities that people don't talk about between the generations. Sure. Like we've all had issues. We all have our strong suits. No one likes to talk about that. They just like to be like, Gen Z's lazy, they're entitled, but it's like, hey, if you just throw negative stuff at someone and with no solutions and you're not willing to have a conversation, what's the goal of that? You yeah. know what I mean? I have a question I haven't really thought of before. It, when we're talking about Gen Zs, we're talking about 10 to 25-year-olds, and we're, right now we're, we're titling them Gen Zs. Yeah. But do you think that the 10 to 25-year-olds, let's take off the title for a minute, of this generation are different from the, t the 10 to 25-year-olds of my generation, yeah, for example, yeah. or the generation, there's a couple of generations between your generation yeah. and my generation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that all, all people, I, I don't want to call them kids, but all people from 10 to 25 have the same challenges in every generation? Or do you think that Gen Z has specific challenges because of maybe 
you, you know, there's so many, there's so many things that come to my mind. It's like yeah. my gener- my grandparents' generation went through the depression. Yeah. Right. They had a certain mindset, right? Hard work was ingrained in them. And, yeah. Yeah. And my grandmother stuffed money under a mattress because of the depression. So there was things that even when they left the depression, they di- didn't leave them. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't go through depression. Mm-hmm. And, but my my generation went through the Vietnam War. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we saw, you know, our uncles and our, you know, I was the last, I, I was the first generation to not be drafted. Yeah. First birthday. So, you know, do you think those those incidents, and, I, I, and I, we could go on and on, right? Right, right. And I'm like, do you think that this 10 to 25-year-olds, if we took off the title Gen Z, has very similar challenges and attitudes that let's say they had 50 years ago? Mm. I think I think there's always going to be challenges for sure. Um, but I think the thing that's mostly different right now is actually the, um, what's it called? I think right now for 10 to 25 year olds, this generation is, they've got the most opportunity to become successful at their age, I think. Um, and I think, by far, this generation gives the most opportunities for people to become successful and go after their dreams um, because of stuff like social media or um, just how big you can grow a platform and how well you can sell stuff, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's also where the biggest challenge comes in because as soon as you, say, post something on social media, that's where you have the most opportunity for people to come out with hate. And I think hate is a big thing that stops people from wanting to grow and wanting to try different things is because they're scared of how people will view them. So I think that's definitely a big challenge for people growing up in this generation. What do you think, I think, like you mentioned, there's unique challenges for each one. I mean, I don't think it's fair to compare a war to hate on social media, and that's not like me disagreeing with Josh. (coughs) What I'm saying is like there is unique challenges with each generation. I think right now this generation is the easiest to make money, but what's being instilled doesn't contribute to that opportunity. Yeah. Say more about that. I think we are presented with so many opportunities, mm. but if you're not a go-getter, what does that do? Well, that leaves you with all this stuff in front of you, and what is that? When, people, when they don't know what to do, they complain, or they blame it on someone else. And so I think growing up in a generation where we have so many opportunities, but maybe not the people instilling it to be like, hey, that's like you need to actually go and get that. So I don't know that it's fair to compare because war and hate on social media are so different, and I, I just don't think it's fair to compare those. But I do think that the bar and the standard for our generation has been set so low, and yeah. for teenagers that don't know what to do, they want to fit in, and so that mm-hmm. means they go down to the bar. So, you know, they smoke, they drink, because all that is normal, and that's looked up upon in a sense. And so I think if we can reset that standard to a place mm-hmm. of self-responsibility, like if you want it, go and get it, and you don't actually have to come down to a standard, but you rise up to a standard. Yeah, that's really good. The number one, um, the number one um, uh, killer of youth in our in this generation is suicide. Mm-hmm. What do you think is driving that? I know that's not on the notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I you, mean, could, and you could say I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. You could say I have no idea, but. I, I, it's just, it's just a, it's a really big deal right yeah, now. Yeah, right? it's huge. It's so real, and it's, I think it's great that we're getting to a point where it's so normalized to talk about. But here's where I think maybe a contributor is coming in, and I first off just want to say, like, it is real. It happens. Like yeah. all that stuff is so real. But listen, if we can, if we continue to push that, uh, I mean, mental health is it's real and it's normal. But if it gets to the point where you have you have to i don't know how to communicate this in a way where it's like if i go to school and all my best friends are dealing with mental health well all of a sudden i feel left out and when you don't know what to do and you Mm. feel left out you always you all of a sudden want to be with the crowd and i'm not saying people are faking it but what i'm saying is that they want to belong right and if we but if that's where we're setting the standard where it's so normal people want to be normal and so when they don't know what to do they want to be normal and and i think It's like, let's have the open conversation, but let's also put a plan in place. Let's not just be like, I have mental health. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to tell everyone. Well, it's like, well, then let's put a plan in place. Let's take action, self-responsibility. Yeah, Yeah, it's a little bit, I think, I know you want to say something too, Josh. And in my generation, to fit in, you you pretty much did drugs. Yeah. 
or you actually, there was lots of, there were some who didn't actually do drugs, but they just told everybody they did just because that's, that's, that was kind of the rite of passage into the cool crowd. Right? Yeah. But this generation is more like sexuality. Uh, you know, there's, there's in, in my mind, different kinds of sexuality that kind of gives you a rite of passage in the cool crowd or mental health issues that kind of mm-hmm. give you right of passage in the cool crowd, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and so you were going to say something I interrupted you, I think. Sorry. No worries. Um, I was kind of wanting to add from the last point, mm-hmm. the last question that you made. Um, I think it definitely does come full circle with, like, the challenges versus the benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, where, like, say if you put... You, you mean the opportunities that, with, yeah. that this generation has. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Like, say if you grabbed... 100 um, Gen Z, say 10 to 25 year olds yeah. from the Great Depression, people who were striving as hard as they could to like put money, yeah. on the f- uh, put food on yeah. the table for their family and then put them in our generation right now versus the other way around. I think we'd have 100 millionaires versus 100 people who wouldn't really know what to do. So I think that's where the that's difference really is. That's really interesting. Um, you're, you're saying, like, if you took the, the Gen Z 10 to 25 They would not survive. And yeah. you put them back in, let's say, the days of the Depression or whatever that my grandparents yeah. ran. Yeah. You'd be like, they, 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 would, eat, yeah, they would climb or die, right? Right. Exactly. Would. Right. I, I mean, I think that's partially, but it's also what's been normalized now. Exactly. Is mm-hmm. it's like, it's, it's so comfortable. I mean, Gen Z, like, not everyone's situation is the same, but Gen Z, we're growing up in more of a comfortable, and, but, but what does that leave opportunity for? Well, all of a sudden, comfort is enough, and now we need to change other things. It's yeah. like, it's never, it's never enough for people. And so it's yeah. like, yeah. now it's like, great, we, we're not in the middle of a war, we're not in a civil war, we have food on the table, but what's the next problem? Let, yeah. Let's make another problem. But Yeah, that's what I was kind of trying to get at, where yeah. it's like, right now, Everybody has, or I wouldn't say everybody because that's just not true. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people common, have. Common. Yeah, it's common to have a really good start in your life at the moment. Like you can start, you can have a really good family life. It's pretty common to have that at the moment. Um, and that opens up opportunities to work really hard and set yourself up for a, a bigger and brighter future. But a lot of people see this great start and then they get comfortable and then they don't want to work hard because they've got everything pretty easy so far. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, they're, they're, this is the most fatherless generation in history. Yeah. And so I wouldn't disagree with you. I'd say if you have a family, you have you have a, uh, you have a superior c- advantage. For sure. 100%. But even if you don't have a family in this generation, like if you don't have a dad in this generation, I mean, basically income in my grandfather's day was, you know, in the agricultural age, Mm -hmm. you basically had to go work really hard, right? Like it was all based on basically how tough you were, like how persevering you could be, how hard working. But in the information age, I mean, the jobs in the information age pay, you know, significantly, sometimes ridiculous (laughs) wages for that young people can make because the skill they have to, you know, to do things on the internet. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, you know, it sounds crazy, but there was no internet when I was... <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and we, had a, we had a small internet business 25 years ago, and the internet was just, you know, I mean, we were dealing with dial-up. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, you could only... The, the speed of the internet kept, w- like, determined what you could actually do on right. it, right? So the, the, the explosion of technology mm-hmm. has opened the door for this generation, right? This yeah. is maybe, in my mind, the most innovative, inventive, imaginative generation in modern history, for sure. Maybe yeah. in the history yeah. of the world. I yeah. agree. And it, well, it's because like, we have it at our fingertips. Yeah. So it's like when we're set up so well, there's going to be so much innovation. But then for the people that aren't willing to innovate or aren't go-getters it leaves them behind in a sense. Yeah. I think yeah. that's what happens with a lot of teenagers. It's like, they don't know what to do, so they do nothing. Well, it's like, hey, you're not going to, let's, then they do that, then they complain. Well, it's like, is there any self-responsibility here? Like, are you yeah. actually going to go and figure out what you do want to do? Mm-hmm. Or is it just, I don't know what to do, I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, because I feel like right now, I mean, if you want to start a business, there you go. You can start a business in like 10 minutes, you can set up a Shopify store and start selling stuff. Like it's, it's as easy as that nowadays, but if it was back in the day, you want to become an artist, you've got to go find a big chunk of stone and start chipping away. Like, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very different now. Um, 
and go to you know school for four years to get someone to teach you how to chip that stone. Right. Exactly. On right. and yeah. on and on, right? Yeah, I think now, like, I like how you said the information age, that yeah. you can pretty much learn anything from what you have at your fingertips nowadays. I think that's really special. I mean, when I was in high school, the big deal was learning how to type. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Like, I took typing and never did learn how to type, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, if you could type, you were like, you could get a job if you could learn to type, right? right? right. Somebody right. will hire you to type documents. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> nowadays, it's like everybody learns to type. And the motivation yeah. is to, you know, if you want to work on your computer, you got to kind of know how to type. So it's yeah. like, it was a big thing if you, you know, it was a big deal to learn how to type now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, my 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 grandkids at 8, 9, and 10 can work a keyboard. Yeah. Right. Because they're younger giving seven-year-olds Chromebooks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what, you know, what, okay, uh, not, we're off script, but uh, th- this came to my mind. Video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We didn't have video games when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, the next generation had video games, but they n- were nothing like the video games that you guys yeah. have now. Yeah. And uh, how, do you, I guess I'm going to make a statement and let you guys respond. And, right. and ple- feel free to even rebuke me. Yeah. Okay. But it feels like this generation, the Zs, are, they often know their machines better than they know their parents. Yeah. You know, you can hide away in your bedroom and just get lost. Mm-hmm. In, in, in playing games and how you can play them, you know, globally and all of the crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it it, 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 you know, in my day, they they accused us of watching television all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, was only partly true. Right. But this day, you can kind of hide away in fantasy. Yeah. How yeah. do you think that's affecting this generation? Or first of all, maybe asking fairness. Yeah. Do you think that's affecting this generation? Yes, 100%. I think it goes back to what we were saying before. When it's so accessible, that comes with such big problems and such, such big advantages, right? When it's so easy to consume and get on, it's like it is going to suck away people's lives. Like that's 100% true. Yeah. I think where it comes into play is like, is there like, do you have any self-control? You know what I mean? Like, if you have any self-control, then you can get yourself off the games, but it is a very easy hideaway. It's a very easy way for people to escape reality. I'm not a massive video game player myself, but I feel like it's a reasonable statement. Definitely, because I feel like now, especially with, like, VR, virtual reality... Oh, yeah. You can put a virtual reality headset on and feel like you're in the real world, but you've been playing a video game for eight hours, and then you'll just realize, oh, I've just wasted a whole day in something that felt that I felt like was real, but actually wasn't. So I think it's that where people are feeling like what they're doing is completely real and beneficial then they realize that they just did something by sitting down for eight hours, you know? Okay, loaded question. Do you think there's any advantage to all of that kind of gaming technology Definitely. for yeah. this generation? Mm-hmm. Do you think it does anything good for that generation? I mean, I think anywhere, it it's probably like, and it's probably one of those things where, like, me and my dad have this conversation all the time. Like, he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand why someone would sit down and watch someone else play video games. So I think anywhere where there's an audience, there's going to be benefits and downfalls. So, you know, you have gamers yeah. who play Fortnite, and they make a million, two million dollars a year <laughs> because they have a bunch of nine-year-olds yeah. sitting there and watching them. So yeah. it's like, are the nine-year-olds getting something beneficial? But then you also sit down, like, when I was a kid, was watching cartoons beneficial? It's entertainment. So, like, yeah. how beneficial is entertainment? Yeah. You know? I think my thing with it, I think it can be very beneficial because say there's a crowd of people who don't necessarily get along well with people at all. Like yeah. they're introverts. I think gaming is given such a platform for introverts to shine through because they don't have to be with people in real life to be able to connect. It's also kind of scary. It is as well, but I feel like it's it's <laughs> you given. Think, <laughs> do you, do you <laughs> think that might be why people are shooting people? Like they don't yeah. actually know how to how to like interact with humans yeah you know I, no i'm not saying you're wrong i'm no, just no, asking no. it as a question and sometimes yeah. sometimes putting people in a room where they don't have to actually learn how to mm-hmm. have people skills is also the other side right Ain't definitely it? i just think it's been able to help people who have felt like unwanted in That's in, really in social crowds feel yeah. wanted in yeah. their own sa- in this safe space of their room they now have a community where they feel loved um and then it comes to like tournaments where people can go and play and feel like people across the world 
worship me for how good I am at playing this video game. Totally. And it's giving people who have never really had that recognition in their life yeah. a platform to be able to get that. And I think that's been beneficial. I think that's really good. I, I mean, there are lots of people that are not good at sports. They're not good at music. They're not good at anything that kind of hip and they don't, they don't have a gig that, that people love, yeah. but they're, but they have great minds and they, yeah. and they're they're They have a strategic mind and they're, yeah. they're competitive. And so this kind of what you're saying is, it's helping to give them a place. Exactly. And yeah. I, I think that I think that's really true, guys. What would you, how would you like to end? What, what's your vision for tomorrow? You're 16. You're 18. Are you going to do this the rest of your life? Well, I think here's where like the goal comes into play. Realistically, are we going to change every single teenager's mindset? No. But I don't think. I mean, that's just like an unrealistic goal. I think. The goal is that, I mean, if we're reaching four to six million teenagers a month, I mean, that's already making an impact. So I feel like every time we upload, it's a goal accomplished. Um, I think long term, I think if we can, if we can at least aggregate a group of people that are setting a standard that's higher and by showing that with guests and just through our conversations, if we can at least change a few people's lives, I mean, we've had girl, we've had, we had a girl that messaged us from, I, I believe she was in New York and she's like, I've never been to church. I've never felt safe in my own home. I don't know what it is. I found you guys on TikTok. She's like, since then, I've listened every week. So it's like, bam, goal accomplished. Yeah. Or we've had teachers. We've had teachers across the country that play our show in their class to feel closer with their class because teachers are trying to figure out how do I how connect. do I connect yeah. with these kids that are 10 and 12 years old? And if we can be that bridge where we're helping both generations better understand the connection and what we can do together... I think that's the goal. And I think we're doing yeah. that every week. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. And there's also been people who have been dealing with depression or suicidal thoughts who have watched our show and then realized that they have like a safe a safe place, as Knight was saying. Um, and it's helped them get through that. And also people who have wanted to start a business but never had the motivation and have watched our show and then now are successful. Um, or they just don't know they, it's realistic. Yeah, they don't exactly. know it could be a thing. And that's amazing. Yeah. You guys are – you're actually – I know it sounds a little spiritual, but you're actually shepherding a group of people mm. that are many of them unreached, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you're 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 like you're talk you're speaking in their language, like Daniel had to learn the language of Babylon. Yeah. You're speaking in their language. You're you're actually that age, mm -hmm. so you're speaking to your generation, not at your generation. Exactly. Yeah, and you're and you're inspiring them and building a bridge to the next generation. Thank you guys so much for being on. Oh, of course. How could they your your podcast? Yeah. How do they get on it? You guys can listen anywhere. All social media is at Juvie Podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast. We do weekly. If there's any parents listening, maybe send the show to your kid and then have a conversation That's about a it. That's something that we've heard is like the parents like it because they better understand teenagers and teenagers like it because they feel like they're talking with their friends. And then parents and kids have had conversations about our show. So if like maybe, you know, I'm assuming more parents are going to be listening to this than teenagers, yeah. but parents that are better trying to understand. We don't have all the answers, but at least you can feel more connected through a conversation. That's beautiful. Yeah. And Juvie is J-U-V-Y. Yeah, any, right. any platforms. Yeah, any platform. Every Saturday. Every single Saturday. Guys, thanks for being on. Of course. God bless Such you both. Us. So proud of both of you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.